but we will go ahead and get this show started and we will go ahead and get it kicked off by looking backwards a little bit. So do you want to just read this headline to refresh everybody's memory, honey? The scandal roiling one of the nation's biggest megachurches explained. Accusations of child molestation from decades ago have brought down a pastor who founded one of the largest megachurches in the U.S. and once served as an evangelical advisor to former President Donald Trump. Texas pastor Robert Morris recently admitted to inappropriate sexual behavior with a 12-year-old girl in the 1980s and stepped down from his his post at Gateway Church based in Dallas. So, of course, we all remember that. Um, It was a very big news story when it broke, but it really hasn't died down. Um, You know, much has happened in just a few short months since that scandal broke, and that's really what I wanted to look at today. So, as this article stated, Gateway Church was one of the largest churches in the country, and I believe they claim to have over 100,000 attendees per week at all their different campus churches. Um, And Robert Morris, the lead pastor and founder of Gateway, was one of the most like highly thought of pastors in the nation, at least by the people that were in his, you know, sphere of Christianity. We all remember the videos of Mike Todd, you know, lavishing Mm -hmm. praise on Robert Morris, Stephen Furtick, and all the rest of them. Praising Robert Morris is just, you know, great teacher, man of God. So you might assume that with such a high performing church and such a solid teacher and discipler of men, that if any church could weather the storm, it would be gateway, you would assume. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't appear to be the case. (laughs) So uh, let's just look at some of what has transpired since Robert Morris resigned. So shortly after, and I have all these articles, they'll be linked down in the show notes. Of course, you can go read them for yourself. I'm going to try to find the different points that I'm pulling out in here and talking about. But if I don't get them up on the screen, just know all the articles are down in the show notes. You can read them for yourself. But shortly after um, Robert Morris resigned, uh, let me see if I I at least want to start off with what I'm talking about here. Um, Yeah, shortly after he resigned, by June 28th, a lawsuit or a uh, law firm handling the investigation. So Gateway Church announced an internal investigation. The law firm handling that investigation recommended that um, three of the church's elders take a leave of absence. And then also James Morris, who is Robert Morris's son, he voluntarily stepped down And James Morris was slated to take over as the senior pastor of Gateway. Um, But then again, he came out with a statement in July. So the resignation of Robert happened in June. In July, James Morris put out a letter um, voluntarily stepping down. And then in August, by August 1st, um, Gateway announced that they were um, parting ways with two additional elders Uh, And these were two of the founding elders of Gateway Church. And then it was found out that just earlier to that, um, Gateway had settled two lawsuits. And one of them had to do with sexual abuse and the other had to do with discrimination. So that was a lot to happen. So in response to James Morris stepping down, because James Morris was supposed to take over the church after Robert stepped down. So Robert Mm -hmm. resigned. His son James was going to take over. But a month later, he stepped away. So Mm -hmm. to fill that leadership void that was left by Robert and then James, um, Max Licato, you know, famous Christian author and pastor, him and a gentleman named Joachim Lundquist, they became interim pastors at Gateway Church, which I would assume they are still 
serving as interim pastors there. And then uh, just recently, oh, let me close that. Just recently, Gateway Church announced that they were going to be canceling their major sort of annual church conference for this year. Mm -hmm. Which, interesting, as I was reading through this uh, article here, at last year's Gateway Church conference, one of the keynote speakers was Tony Evans, who also stepped back from his pastoral Mm -hmm. role this last year due to undisclosed reasons. Um, Just a little interesting tidbit there. Um, But what else? Still more is going on at Gateway. So one of Gateway Church's um, campus churches, if you will, has also announced that it's changing its name. They no longer want to be associated with Gateway Church. So this Gateway Houston, they're changing their name now to Newlands Church. And then the last... Uh, no, that's a, a different story. Well, we'll touch on that one here in a second. But I read a report that Gateway has lost nearly 20% of their weekly attendees since June, since this scandal broke. So roughly 20,000 attendees <laughs> have chosen to go elsewhere. Hmm. Um, and then, oh yeah, that's this story. So in addition to that, some of them chose to just be done with organized religion altogether. So, wow. Um, a lot has happened in a few uh, months. So, honey, what do you make, if anything, of Gateway Church and Robert Morris mm. in roughly three months since his scandal and re- uh, resignation? I mean, it's pretty chaotic. I'm sure there's a lot of anger. I'm sure there's a lot of rumors and it's probably like too much for people to take that's probably all that's talked about when people go to church that's probably the topic still and i think people are just getting worn out and that's um i don't know it is a big deal and i think it is something that's going to take um a long time to sort out and for people to forgive as things come out um I'm sure there's people who, you know, don't really watch the news or anything and maybe didn't know about it. And, um, you know, I, I, I mean, the church we went to in Clovis, this is kind of the same thing that happened. The son was supposed to take over. He didn't, um, he ended up moving and taking over another church somewhere else. I believe another state, maybe Texas, but I, I get it. I mean, I wouldn't want to. I get it that the son wouldn't want to stick around. I'm going to touch on. The I don't son. know. I may not feel quite the same as you. I'm going to touch yeah. on the son here in a minute. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, it is chaotic. I do hope, for the sake of Gateway and the people there, that they're not still harping on this every week. I hope that they've turned their attention back to Christ, where it should be. But you're right; it's chaotic, and um, they're still dealing with the chaos. I would really hope that this would cause a lot of people to be introspective Um, because, you know, you said this is expected, but to me, this is all kind of baffling. I feel like when I look at all the stuff that's happening now, Robert Morris, again, we didn't know much about Robert Morris, but he was basically a rock star in kind of that big Eva word of faith Christian camp. But as I'm reading all this, I'm like, should this big of a fallout just be reasonable? Should we just be like, well, of course that's happened. And again, it's confusing to me that this big of a fallout would happen. Um, But I think that there are a lot of questions that I think you should want to ask if you're in that environment, in that situation. Like, for one, if you're ordaining elders that are based on 1 Timothy, and they're, you know, upholding that standard to maintain their eldership, why are any of them being asked to step down or voluntarily stepping down? Like, yeah, Robert Morris screwed up, but that shouldn't affect these other men unless they were also unqualified. And then in that case, why did the church have unqualified men on its elder board? That's something they should be examining. 
then why is 20% of the church leaving and going elsewhere? Like, what were you going to church for? Is a question they should be asking themselves. Who were you going to see? Was it Robert Morris or was it Jesus? And I think we kind of have the answer to that, but this should cause those who left the church really to look at themselves like, you know, hey, going to this church and when the going got tough with my brothers and sisters in the faith, I bailed because it was just a bit too much. Hmm. What exactly was I going to church for at Gateway, right? And what am I going to be looking for in my next church if that's the case? These are questions that they should be asking themselves, I think. Well, I think a lot of people who go to churches, they I mean, 20% is sounds accurate. Maybe it, was, it should be more, but I mean, I think it would be more just because people go to church because it's a, just a social thing. They, they don't go to, um, to really learn. They dislike the motivational speeches, the, you know, all the word of faith kind of things overcoming your battle and it's very self-focused and not Christ-focused kind of sermons. Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't heard all of his sermons, but I mean, I haven't heard many sermons, obviously not all of them, but I think that's, I think the 20% that left probably are maybe people who haven't been there long. I don't know. I mean, you can, you can speculate so. a lot. You can make a lot of assumptions. I mean, if the church is that big, 20%, left, you could say, well, 20% of people who go to church aren't really committed. They're just there because it's something to do and it's easy to go to another church. And maybe they'll, maybe it's a good thing. Sure. Maybe God wants them in another church. Yeah. Or they're really, a, a hope we can have. Maybe this is, you know, good for them. Like God's going to work it out for those who are his. So for sure, he won't lose any. Um, that's for sure. But you know, this is a big problem with mega churches. And, you know, a lot of these mega church pastors like Robert Morris, they, again, they become rock stars in a sense, you know. And I would have guessed that a lot of people that go there, they're not there to find Jesus and be part of a family of believers. They're not there to be like striving together in this life, you know, having their eyes fixed on eternity and all of that. Um, they're there because, you know, it's Robert Morris's church. Like, it's cool to go to Robert Morris's church. And I imagine, you know, if you're, yeah, I don't know. I would have just imagine hopefully some of that 20% left to be like, man, I got to find a real, a real church. And honestly, that's how I would feel. I would, I would leave. Right. You know, you might have a different take, but I mean, obviously we wouldn't go to a church like that. I just, maybe if we were someone who was there from the beginning, but if we heard the rumor, ever that, you know, about what happened, it, we would be like, wow, why did this never get brought up? Why did nobody consider it? They all heard the rumor and just didn't want to deal with it. Sure. Um, and, you know, again, I hope in, if we were in that situation, we would be introspective as well. You know, although our church did go through something not to this degree of, you know, sort of exposed sin, but they did deal with some struggle and you know, a lot of the church members left, but a lot of them stayed. And I'm sure that they had to look inside themselves and decide, you know, why they were there and if it still made sense, you know, so I'm sure we would do the same, but I hope that, you know, we're making our choice on a church for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think people should be looking inside. I think also Robert Morris should be looking inside. He should be, of anybody, maybe the most introspective here. Now, not much has been heard from Robert Morris specifically. I don't think he's really done much outside of resigning since June, but hopefully he is asking himself a lot of questions. Like, again, with the eldership, he should be asking himself, like, what is going on with the eldership that I put together mm -hmm. that these men, first off, couldn't hold me accountable, and now they're all getting, you know, removed or voluntarily, voluntarily leaving? That's not great. He should be asking himself, why are all of his congregants leave, uh, leaving? Like, mm -hmm. didn't he point them to Christ? Because it seems not, at least for, you know, a large number of them. And then even with regard to his son, why is his son leaving? You know, when really his son should be the glue that's holding this church together, you would think. Um, so maybe that's a question he could ask, like, 
what was I raising him? What was I teaching him all these years mm -hmm. in the church here? And I think this is a large reason why James tells us that teachers are going to be held to a higher account. They're going to be judged more harshly. Um, so there appears to be a lot that Robert Morris let slip over the years. And if you read the story, you know, the one about the staffer who's done with organized religion, she even makes the point in her statement or this article that like, it wasn't really a church after a while. It was a, it was a corporation, you know, it was a corporation and he was a CEO and which of course we know that's what a mega church is, mm -hmm. but that's sort of what she was coming to realize. And, uh, just going to his son, because I think that's a maybe the one that I have the biggest problem with. You know, you talked about the church we went to um, briefly, but was in our town, and how when they had their scandal, which was the same thing, sexual immorality broke the church apart, and he left. He went to a different state to start a new church, just like James is doing. And my thought is, why would anybody want to go to that church that this son is going to start? Like you literally have recent relevant evidence that when the going gets tough, he's not going to stand with you as a pastor. Like what's the message he's going to give to his congregation about being a family standing with each other through these difficulties? Because we know he won't. <laughs> he's proven it that might he have won't. come out the same with the other church. Um, we went to the whole family knew about it and kept it secret. Which, but if that's the case, he's again. unqualified to be a pastor. Right. It's that all the leadership, you know, swept it under the rug. They're all corrupt. And I think that's a common thing. I think it's. Ha I think it happens to a lot of churches, and it's just not found but out. We don't know that about James. At least I don't. We don't know that he knew about this. We don't know necessarily that he covered anything up. All no, we really know, know is that his dad resigned, the church is in chaos, and his response to that is, I'm going to step away, and I'm not just stepping away from church. I'm going to go and start a different church that doesn't have all the baggage. Man, that's a really bad look. And it made me think of my time in the military, which not trying to necessarily slander anybody. This is just my experience, you know. Um, I've really only ever heard one message from military leadership my entire career. Every commander, every enlisted leader is that, you know, we're family, we're teammates, we're all in this together, right? We've got your back. If you need anything, we're here for you. And then COVID hit, right? Chaos came and no one was around to have those who um, refused the vaccines back. Uh, you know, things got a little bit bumpy and they were all alone. Those members that were told that they were family, they pretty much got booted out of the service without a single apology as fast as they could. And I've still never heard a military leader apologize for what happened during COVID. And to me, this is James Morris, you know, uh, hey, we're a family, we're in this together. We, we're going to face, you know, trials and persecution in this life. But if we stick together, we can strengthen each other. And then the, the road got a little bit bumpy and he's gone off to start a new church. I just think it's a terrible look. My recommendation would be if you're considering going to James uh, Morris's church, I would tell you to consider a different church. Uh, I would say that's likely not the place for you and your family. Just based on recent relevant evidence, I don't think that's the place for you. I don't know. I think it would be, it might be like maybe his wife doesn't want any, I just can't imagine all the family drama. Um all the anger, like it would be, that would be really hard. Like it would be hard on his family and who, oh, who knows sure. how much of their family goes to that church. Um, I don't know. I, I don't, I just don't think it don't should think, be like, imagine going to that church. I'm just thinking of me as a Christian and like, Hey, your dad, because again, let's be honest. Like what Robert Morris did was in the eighties. And yes, there might have been lies and cover-ups, but the sin he's accused of, the sexual sin, happened 40 years ago. So I can't imagine still going to church with James and being like, huh, look at you. Your dad did this and that. And like, if he's not guilty of a cover-up, if he didn't know about it or lie about it, yeah, then 
I can't imagine I would have much to say to him on an endless basis where his wife is constantly fretting and pulling her hair out that, oh, we have to go to church. Like, yeah, I mean, my goodness, there have been pastors in the past that have their churches are being raided, people being killed. I mean, you look at some of these churches in the more communist, atheistic countries and like, it's just one pastor after another getting arrested to haul off to jail and the next pastor steps up knowing he's going to be arrested and hauled off to jail. Yeah, but that's and then the next pastor that's step, like Christian persecution. This is not. This is like a stress and it, it's different. Like you said, it's a corporation. It's it's m- not shouldn't be a, a church. Like this church wouldn't <laughs> handle persecution. But um it's just bizarre to me. Um that he would step away as the son. It would give me I mean, I, I wouldn't go to his church. Um, but I do want to finally address the staffer who is done with organized religion, because this might be the stupidest result of all of it. <laughs> um, uh, and here again, like this could just be a result of a bigger issue with like seeker sensitive kind of church mindset. Because again, did you not know what you were getting into when you're sitting in that building? You're sitting there with sinners. There's a sinner to the left of you, sinner to the right of you. There's a sinner on the stage <laughs> preaching the message to you. Did you not know that when you were sitting there? Um, and did the church not point you to Christ rather than the man on the stage? You know, was Robert Morris like so much larger than life and he was bigger than your view of God or something? He distorted your view of God. I don't know what happened there. Um Now, the woman who left in this article here, she talks about how, you know, she suffered spiritual abuse at Gateway, though she doesn't actually discuss what that abuse was. She just mentions she suffered spiritual abuse, as did others. And then the article mentions that they had asked her, well, why don't you consider a smaller church? (laughs) And she said, well, she had gone to smaller churches. And would you guess? She suffered spiritual abuse there as well. Now, uh, maybe she's telling the truth. Maybe she's just trying to justify her own lack of faith. I don't know. I read this and it's kind of like those, like a hotel review. You know, you go to like a Ritz Carlton and it's like five star reviews and you look at like the one star and there's like three one star reviews and they're like, this place sucks. The beds are uncomfortable and the food's terrible. And you're like, is it at a Ritz Carlton? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you complain about everything. Just uh, just a thought there, right? Yeah. So I don't know. You know, maybe this is just her lack of faith and she's pushing the blame off on Robert Morris and, you know, these other churches. But uh, just an FYI, if that's your view, um, you know, your lack of faith is not going to um, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And you're like, ah, I bailed on the whole church and organized religion, you know. I'm suffering this spiritual abuse everywhere I go. So I I'm just doing it alone, Lord. And he's the, like, yeah, not good enough. This is all a lot of people knew about Christianity. I mean, they've never gone to a church that actually teaches the word of God instead of topical sermons about yourself, who you are, and all that. I mean, I would bail too if that's what it's if that's all I knew that Christianity was, I, I get it. You don't know the true gospel. You don't know what it's truly like to, um, to know the Lord and to know a true Christian, someone who can really disciple you. That, that is kind of understandable if it's just a show and church is just for your enjoyment. Um, it makes sense that that many people would leave that that many people would um, because like you've said before, like the way we used to do church, you didn't, you never thought like you could be a pastor that you could teach that. Yeah, so, for sure. I couldn't. Um, and again, this could just be a seeker sensitive mindset where, you know, Hey, church is for you. Christ is for you. He's here to overcome your battles and supercharge your life. And then you see chaos hit and people start bailing and you're like, that's not what you told me. Um, instead of like, you know, preaching the message that you will be hated in this world, difficulty will come, 
you know, your faith is going to be shaken. You're surrounded by sinners who are all striving. Like, if that's the message you hear, then maybe you can weather the storm, but that's not what seeker-sensitive churches preach. So it, again, I mean, to your point, it does probably make sense if you're sitting in a church like that, that when the going gets tough, you're going to be like, well, that's not what we were told. So I'm out. I wonder so. what they do. Like, so if you like are interviewed to take over this church and they ask you, you know, the question, how would you handle this situation? You know, if you were here when it happened, gone. like the way you answer that is whether or not you're hired on. You know, are you like your point is like be committed. So Should be part of their what would happen <laughs> if you were process. Yeah. I mean Hypothetically, this is like, more revelations come out. Another forty percent of the church bails and you're interviewed about, you know, harboring known liars and perverts for decades. How do you handle that? And you're like, uh, are you gonna leave? No. I'll stick it out. And then it happens. You got to be a man of your word too. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So just, you know, kind of for everyone out there listening, uh, just as kind of our recommendation, if you're going to a church, just know that it's full of sinners and they will disappoint you if you hold them too high. Uh, They aren't perfect. They make mistakes. They're humans just like you. And you know, with this idea of a staffer bailing on all organized religion, to me, this is far more of an atheistic mindset than a believer's mindset. You know, atheists love to point out the flaws of individuals and then try to saddle Christianity with that individual's problems. You know, it'd be like, oh, Robert Morris abused a girl. See, Christianity is abusive. And you're like, no, Robert Morris is a sinner in need of a savior. So go look to Jesus, my friend. Uh, so which is why your pastor should not be holding themselves um, high. They should be lifting Christ high. That should be the overriding message of your church. And maybe it sounds like Robert Morris wasn't necessarily necessarily doing that, or it wasn't the impression he was giving off. So things aren't going well at Gateway, and it's only been three months. So um, maybe they can right this ship, and maybe it can open their eyes to what they've been doing in the past. And it's, you know... This is that whole church growth equals church success. Hopefully, Gateway's realizing that's not quite true. Um, You know, righteousness is church success. So do you have any final thoughts on Gateway Church, Robert Morris, all of organized religion as a whole? Anything? No, we don't. Yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll always talk about it again. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll hear some positive news coming out of James yeah. Morris. Maybe he's decided, you know what? Like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when the war broke out and rather than being um, drafted into the army, he sailed to America to find safe harbor. And then when he got off the ship in America, his conscience was racked with guilt that he bailed on his countrymen during their time of greatest need. So he got back on that ship, sailed back to Germany, and would you know it, he was arrested shortly thereafter and died in a concentration camp. But he did the right thing. He did the right thing. He weathered the storm as best he could with his countrymen. So maybe James Morris, uh, maybe he'll read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and he'll come back to Gateway and maybe try to lead them through this difficult time rather than cutting and running. Yeah, I don't know much about him. <clears throat> if anyone knows James yeah. Morris, send him Eric Metaxas' book on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He might need it. so Or send him Religionless Christianity by Eric Metaxas. He highlights this point as well. So, all right. Um, 